welcome to Tea Talks Unfiltered, the podcast where we drink tea, we talk, and they're both unfiltered. My name is Jake, and I will be your host. And on today's episode, we're drinking a little bit more of this Shopur tea. And we're going to be discussing how Kung Fu has changed my life. So, welcome to this week's Tea Talk. Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about my last decade. No, actually coming up on about 12 years now. Uh, started in, in 2010. Uh, so about 12 years of Kung Fu practice, most of the time living in Wudang, partially as a student, now as a teacher. Um, I wanted to talk about what I've learned, what I've experienced during that time, uh, going into some of the training, but also I wanted to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. But first, I do want to wish everyone a happy International Women's Day. Uh, take a moment to say thanks to all the women in my life for you know, inspiring and supporting me and just being generally awesome, not just today, but all days. Uh, so thank you. I hope that you're celebrating today, uh, but I do hope that you have a moment to enjoy a cup of tea with me. So cheers. Mm, nice. Something mellow to go with the day. So, all right. Well, yeah, let's get started. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the my my time here in Wudang kung fu practice. If that's changed me, I'm not sure. We'll talk about that. Um, but kind of going through the timeline, you know, it's been 12 years training martial arts. Actually, coming up on a full decade of physical uh, time living in Wudang. Um, like I said, there was about five years of that as a student, and now about five years as a teacher, uh, teaching full time uh, since 2018, since the beginning. Uh, so that's been a whole different experience as well. And, and added on top of that, the last two years now, uh, coming up on two years of teaching online and having this platform, um, not just with Tea Talks, but with Wudang Wei and the music channel, uh, having this different medium uh, to conduct this teaching, uh, to go through new methods of learning and, and, and transmitting those, those experiences and those teachings. So a lot to share, you know, every step of the way has definitely been its own journey. Um, there's been unique challenges to every part of that. Um, something I think that I've really met with an open mind, I hope. Um, a lot of things that have challenged me, though, and have been difficult to overcome uh, and get used to doing things like this, being on camera in a room uh, broadcasting like this. All these things have been new, um, but there's also quite a lot of challenges just in the day to day uh, life, the, the experiences I had as a student, as a disciple uh, here at the academy. Um, you know, it's never been an easy path to take, but I hope that those rewards, those lessons, those benefits have developed uh, some of my own character along the way. So today I want to share with you some of those lessons and hopefully give you some perspective of your own. You know, if you're considering your own practice or uh, diving into some own training or new skill. Uh, hopefully this will be something that, that gives you that, that motivation, that inspiration to continue. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of obstacles, but there are also a lot of, of rewards and new perspectives that you'll reach uh, with any practice. Martial arts is the example I come from, but I think that these challenges are something that are meant to help us grow. So I hope that, uh, this gives you a little bit of inspiration as well. So, all right, so I wanna go back uh, and actually just kind of explain some of the things that I actually trained here uh, during the five-year program. Um, martial arts training with my classmates, we live, we train together, uh, we have a certain kind of curriculum that we follow. And while it was structured, it was kind of loose in the sense that we would learn the things that our master, Master Yen, seemed or deemed the most appropriate at the time. So we would we would learn a combination of basic training uh, with forms and weapons that slightly elevated in, in difficulty as the years went on, um, coupled with a lot of internal training, culture classes, you know, chanting, um, a little bit of music in that sense, but no instruments then. Uh, that was that was wasn't something until later that I picked up um, on my own for self study. But there was quite a very comprehensive list of, of what we practiced during the five-year program. 
okay and so i just kind of want to walk through that that system the general structure i don't think i'm going to be able to get everything precise in the exact order um, that we learned it or the exact dates because five years of time training six days a week all year round it just kind of blurs into one giant day <laughs> and it's it, it's sometimes in hindsight looking back it's sometimes hard to like differentiate periods um, unless there's some big key event like a competition or like when we would we would do sparring and fighting all summer or the hard qigong conditioning where we'd beat each other with sticks uh, you know this kind of stuff it's hard to differentiate without that just because the day-to-day -day practice like you've heard in some of the other talks is so structured in the sense that you wake up at the same time you eat the same time you're training generally the same things over and over because it's basic training it's conditioning stamina flexibility stretching all this kind of stuff on repeat right that whole rinse wash repeat uh, we would just kick punch eat sleep repeat um, so there's definitely kind of this daily grind that's happening but in general, there's 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 a there's kind of a recommended list uh, that we would follow as far as learning new uh, forms or new systems. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of walk through some of that, kind of briefly go through it. I'll touch on some of my personal favorites, and I think some of the things that maybe need a little bit extra clarification, uh, just so you kind of know, um, you know, what that means and and how we approached it. Okay. So when I first started training, we typically always start, if you're a long-term student, uh, since we're in the traditional class, we're dedicating for at least three years. I'm going to be referring to the five-year course because that's what uh, I became a part of uh, in the long run. But because of that, we start from the very basics. So empty hand, uh, basic conditioning, fist forms, okay? So we have uh, four forms that I would consider the basic set. We have the actual Jibin Chuan, which means basic fist. And we have the Shuen Gong Chen. Uh, so that is the mysterious skill fist. There are three of those forms. There are three parts, um, but they're, all, they're each individual forms. They're similar in structure, but they get a little bit more uh, comprehensive and difficult uh, as they increase. Okay. So typically, that's the first thing that you learn. You go through those forms. Each form might take you a month. It, it starts to get a little bit quicker as you learn more forms. Like there's a lot of repeat movements. There's a lot of uh, basic coordination pieces that, that you start to pick up on. And once you start learning that kind of framework, right, once you learn that kind of the, the stances, the standard set of the Wudang system, then learning does pick up. But typically, we're going to say like about a month, you know, a couple of weeks for learning. And then it's, you know, drilling forever. Um, with these basic fist forms, the, the basic fist and the mysterious, the mysterious skill set, um, these three forms, together four forms. Um, with this set, this is really your conditioning for stretching the body, getting big, low stances, lots of kick drilling, um, going through lots of different kicks, uh, side kicks, jump kicks, uh, snap kicks, you know, all, all different kinds of kicks just to get your body stretched and strengthened okay so really just your conditioning set kind of getting you con like opened up into the system is really important as a as a traditional like long-term student to have this baseline um, to build off of because these first four forms are very standard in the sense that all the movements are clear precise straight lines very linear okay and in that sense, you start to connect uh, your coordination. Specifically, when we're doing any of the more advanced forms, we start adding lots of body techniques, like with something like dragon, uh, something like the shuang wu fist, uh, or when we get into weapons, like with the wudang straight sword. There's a lot more of embellishment and kind of advanced transitions that might happen that are pretty difficult to pick up on if you don't have that kind of standard uh, foundation to build off of. Right. And so this first three, four months of training is really dedicated to getting your horse stance, your bow stance, you know, all these basic footwork, kicking, flexibility drills done. Uh, not necessarily done. I shouldn't say that, but definitely, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're beginning the training. So that way, you know, them, you're, you're aware of them and you can go through them quickly. Right. 
That way, when you go into learning a new form, you're, you're kind of picking up uh, on the coordination a lot better. Okay. When we get to more advanced movements with body techniques, okay, now we have kind of, we have the footwork taken care of, right? A lot of times when we can, when we talk about learning a form, we, we break it down into four pieces. And so we have footwork, we have handwork, we have body work, and then we have eye work. Okay. So that's like a loose translation, but basically just means you want to learn your stances. You want to learn your hand coordination, like the technique, what you're doing next. You connect that with the body work. Um, so you might have a certain way that you're rotating, a certain way you're moving dynamically uh, to con connect the coordination together. And then the final piece will be your, your energy or your, your, what we would call your Jing Chi Sen, you know, your, your, uh, eye coordination. So where you're looking, kind of your focus, the energy you're bringing, the intention you bring to each movement that becomes really important too. And with these forms, they're so standard, they're so clear cut that you really want to, uh, set that fundamental skill with kind of the appropriate shape. Okay. That way you're building off of something that is well, <laughs> well conditioned, right? You really need that in the beginning. Uh, it's very difficult. I think now as a teacher looking back and there's a lot of students who are very, of course, very impressed and interested in some of the advanced, what I would call the advanced sets, uh, within the Wudang system. And so they will kind of want to jump and learn those things first. And it, it's possible and you can learn it. And if you're learning for health purposes, there's no real problem with that, I think, like, cause you're really practicing for yourself and that keeps you interested. That keeps you motivated. Um, that allows you to improve because it's something that you're really invested in. But as a disciple standpoint, as like a, as an inheritor or someone who wants to be a teacher or someone who wants to transmit these teachings on jumping up to those advanced sets is kind of doing yourself a disservice sometimes because you won't have the connections that these fundamental forms create. Okay. So for me, that that's pretty important, especially as a teacher, um, depending on what your goals are, I think it's a conversation you have to have, like having at least one of these forms is really good of this basic set. Having the full four is also really great, but there is a lot of repeat as well. So, uh, it depends on your time. It depends on your kind of goals. I would say in the traditional class, this is the standard. We start here. And even to this day, uh, Sifu refers to them as kind of the testing, uh, forms, because I think, especially if you practice a more comprehensive set, like you practice the basics, you practice the weapons, the advanced stuff. When you want to see someone's ability as a practitioner to another practitioner, you, you check these forms, right? Because they're the standard, right? With a weapon, with a, some kind of advanced kind of animal movement or some, there's so much more style and there's so much more, uh, I would say there's a lot more uh, of, there's a lot more space to hide coordination, right? with style or with flair or dynamic or, or good technique, right? You, there's little transitions in there that can differ from person to person quite a bit and still be good and still be like, okay, that's, that's still acceptable. It's not, it's not creating any problems for the movement. Like for example, with a sword, you have to have good coordination to have the sword move correctly, right? Or any weapon for that matter. And so because of that, it becomes an extension of you, but it also becomes a tool. It also becomes something that, you know, forces you to create the correct shape. Now with the basic fist set, there's nothing making you do it. You have to create the shape. You have to create the linear lines. You have to make everything clear and precise and stable. And also you have to have the endurance to do the full form because some of the, uh, the, 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 the sectional forms can be kind of long, right? Uh, and lots of kicks. So there's this kind of dynamic stamina conditioning happening in each one. And so when you look at those forms, you can really see kind of the, the general quality of someone's training because they're not pretty, they're not the prettiest forms, right? And so because of that, there's not as much room for you to hide things inside them. Okay. So they are kind of the standard. I, I highly recommend them, uh, even if it's just learning one or two of them because it's going to give you a really comprehensive understanding of the structure, the, the kind of framework that we're building off of in the Wudang system.
Okay, so yeah, basic fist set, that's the first thing we learned, and we, we go back to it so much. Even now, it's it's kind of a, a classic thing for the coaches to get drilled on and be like, okay, we're going to go over this, and you know that's going to be how you improve. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> moving on from there, you know, after that, we would, we would go into uh, other forms. We would probably start learning like the tiger fist form is a pretty good uh, early, early um, uh, fist form. It's not too advanced uh, because all the, all the body movement is grounded. There's no jump kicks. There's no real crazy dynamic stuff. But it's a very good form for building waist coordination. So a lot of dynamic uh, power, a lot of twisting, a lot of combinations that happen uh, where it's getting a little bit more complicated, but it's not too exaggerated, right? It's still very much like a, uh, a rotational axis, right? So you have this kind of going back and forth, uh, developing power, developing timing, and, and this kind of conditioning, okay? Tiger is a really, really great form. Um, because it starts to introduce you to some of these, what I would call the advanced body techniques, this, this kind of simfa. Um, and, and that is just going to be a, 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 a broken down version, right? Where it's not necessarily broken. I shouldn't say that, but it's, it's a simplified version. It's not as complicated as some other systems can be. Like, for example, when we get into the eight immortals, uh, system, or when you get into a specialized system like Bagua. Or, or baji chen or something like that though those sets are going to have their own unique kind of style and system built around them but with something like tiger it's really nice because you're still getting some of those basics you're still building off that but you're introducing some of this uh, speed this different um, like tempo uh, different dynamic directions different angles different parts of the body you're using elbows and things like that now so um, yeah that that's a really good introduction form as well and if you're really, really interested in doing one of those kind of like more stylized, more what you would assume traditional uh, Chinese Kung Fu to be like, Tiger is a really great form. Um, I actually recommend it quite a lot because getting that waist and core rotation is really, really important. And sometimes with the basic fist being so difficult, uh, it's really nice to have something like Tiger that while it's difficult, it also is like more to hold on to, I would say as a, as a, as a student, there's, there's more to kind of engage with in each movement. There's more dynamic pieces to it. It's not as clear cut as the basic fist sets. Okay. So we will learn tiger at the same time. We're probably also learning some of the internal set. So we'll probably start off with things like Taiji 28, um, probably some five animals, Qigong for morning practice and kind of a, a, a variety of internal stuff happening at this point. In my first six months, it, it was quite a lot of catch up. So I learned, I learned pretty quick. Um, after three months, I started going into, uh, different basic weapons, um, going into lots of fist forms, uh, doing, doing internal sets, the Taiji, the Qigong, the Baduanjin, um, doing meditation practices, the standing meditation, cloud hands, all these kind of standard kind of fundamentals for the internal system, the soft styles. I was doing that at the same time. So that kind of, that's kind of the complementing practice, right? I would say in general, Wudang always wants to approach from the outside in. So we want to work on those external forms. We want to work on conditioning, strengthening, stretching, and tempering the body to some degree, and then start working on the internal side. Just because we want to have that foundation once again, right? That's really important. If you have some kind of weakness or you're not understanding some of the coordination, when you go into the slow system, the soft system, internal system, however you want to refer to it, it's a lot easier to go wrong and have a mistake because you won't have the same pressure on that posture that an external system kind of demands, right? And because we share the same stances, we share some of the same coordination between the two sides, um, I, I feel even now it's really, really important to have some basic training of, of some kind, whether or not it's a form, um, just having some of that system as part of your training uh, more dynamically is going to build muscle memory. It's going to make you more aware of your weaknesses or places that need improvement. And it's going to create the right pathways so that when you get to the internal soft systems, you're more conscious, you're more aware of your movement, 
Okay, that, that's really, really important. So I like the tandem practice of having an external and an internal. But if I had to put preference on one or the other, I would definitely recommend external practices first. And that's also the way that we approach it as a traditional class, right? Um, even now, the, um, the traditional class Chinese students who start at a much younger age, they train nothing but external <clears throat> excuse me, they train nothing but external for quite a while um, before they start learning things like Tai Chi Chen or before they start doing uh, meditation or, or, or any of these kind of soft uh, like Qigong practices. There'll probably be some standing meditation, but they'll probably connect it with Mabu, so with horse stance training. <laughs> so it's not, it's not really standing meditation. It's, it's not exactly the same kind of soft system. It's still some kind of conditioning, right? So I like... Com complementing the two practices together but if you had to starting with external is definitely better in the long run right because you're going to again develop that, that 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 starting point okay but we would do things in the first six months we would connect we would start doing taiji 28 we would have early morning qigong evening meditation um, you know that way we have some kind of um, soft practice to not just rehabilitate but also that sensitivity that you're building with an external form is not always apparent right because you're dynamic you're moving it's stamina you might not notice in the moment those weaknesses or those those kind of uh, places that don't connect as well for you when you're just trying to go through a form especially if you're trying to keep up with a group like we were doing uh, just trying to kind of race each other a lot in the beginning you're not really picking up on those fine details so creating that training that that tires you out and beats you up and then switching over to a soft practice later on to cool down or to wake up in the morning that discomfort that you might be getting here from the external from training hard is complemented with that soft practice and you can kind of work on correcting body alignment you know getting used to coordination uh, transferring your weight things like this that i think are are definitely superficial layers to the training but also very essential because you have to learn how to uh, connect your awareness to, to your movement, right? And so a soft practice on the, on the early levels, that's really, really great to have that complementing practice, okay? So we would do a lot of, a lot of this as well. Uh, for our class, uh, being more of an adult class, like a, not, a, not a really old age group, but on average a, older than the, 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 the tr traditional Chinese classes here, we're definitely more interested at the time in in the soft practices and how those can be incorporated into our life more. Um, so I think there's definitely a little bit of shift in in the interest of the class in general. And because of that, it was a really great environment to have you know a group meditation or 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 early morning qigong practices and taiji drilling things like that. Because there was definitely a, a big motivation for for you know learning more about those systems. Uh, especially because it's a break from, you know, doing frog jumps and uh, crazy training. So there's always that as well. Um, yeah, then from there, just kind of moving forward, once you have kind of your basics in each side of the system laid out, things do move a little bit quicker. We start moving into some of the sword forms. Um, we've got uh, the broadsword, which is normally your first weapon, it seems like. That's kind of like the most average used weapon. It, it really helps you to open up the shoulders and to get rid to get used to this really, really large uh, body rotation, uh, very dynamic and powerful movements, but also being able to control it, right? Because there, there is kind of the the, the weight of a broadsword is closer to the end of the sword. And so you have to relax enough to swing big, but you have to keep enough strength to, you know, hold on to it and not let it pull you off balance. And so that's, that's a really good weapon to introduce you um, to, you know, any other Chinese weapon because it's getting that condition. It's getting you used to not just swinging a weapon around or pointing it or doing the right movement, but also engaging the core getting low stances opening the body up all of that is actually going to help you do the broadsword right broadsword is a unique weapon because it has a lot of those uh, movements that you know cover the body and come back out into long slashes and cuts and it's it's the sword that's got a flat side 
and a sharp side. And of course, we're using dull blades and that are a little bit flexible. Um, but just to say that that the dull side, the flattened side, um, can be basically touching the body in some movements. And in some cases, it even bounces off the body. And so you have to engage the muscle at the right time. You have to learn how to breathe so you're not hurting yourself when you do those techniques. Um, you know, these close blocks to the body into large opening movements. All this is really important to gain that coordination. You know, for a weapon, um, everything becomes more important, right? All these fine details of movement become really important. How you breathe affects your coordination, not just your stamina, but it also affects the technique at hand. Um, it, if, you're, if you're holding your breath, you're going to hold your movement. You're going to limit your ability. So there is kind of more demand once you start learning a weapon. Broadsword is a great introduction. Um, Sifu once described the broadsword and the straight sword the difference between the two was, was you know, like the, the straight sword is like a dragonfly landing on water, which I always really like that imagery. Just that very light touching, that very delicate placement, you know, kind of very precise. And the, the broadsword is a tiger falling down a mountain. <laughs> and so you have, this, you have this tiger just sprinting down the mountain and just barely being able to stay on, on their feet. And that's kind of the idea of the, of the, of the broadsword. It's vicious. It's really fast. It's dynamic and dangerous. Right. Uh, so I know even, even training that people would cut their hand, uh, just from holding the broadsword and the hilt, the, the guard, I should say of the sword would, would, you know, rust and be really worn out. Cause we'd use them all the time and, and people would get cut on their hand and not realize it until the end of the form when their whole hand is covered in blood. You know, you got a white uniform that's ruined. Uh, and that's just cause you're just moving the whole time and you could barely nick yourself and you might not recognize it until you're done practicing. You're like, Oh no. <laughs> so yeah, there was definitely like not necessarily a violent nature to broadsword, but it is very intense. Right. And so that's a, that's a great form to kind of get you into the system of, of weapons. Uh, so yeah, like you go tiger fist, then you go into broadsword and then from there, okay, we're moving into straight sword, moving into some of those other, uh, short single hand weapons. Um, but a little bit more precise movement now, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, delicate, elegant, I would say. Um, we've got a lot of sword forms. It's the only weapon form in Wudong that has multiple forms, right? So we've got, you've got your, your, your Shremenjen, which is the, the, the mysterious gate, uh, sword. You've got your dragon sword, your eight immortal sword, uh, Taiji sword, you know, a few others now that are also in there. Um, so that is definitely the kind of the Wudong specialty is, is Tai Chi and, and, uh, the sword, the straight sword. Um, so we start going into those and that's a whole system, you know, lots of conditioning and stances, lots of very precise movements, lots of body techniques, um, changes and techniques with the sword itself. And so you're, while you're learning these sword moves, you're also going through all these basics, you know, you're also going through all this training, um, to learn how to move it properly and what this technique does and things like this. So, you know, each form that we learn is, is learning the movement, but you're, you're also trying to kind of absorb all that information around it as well. And you're challenged all the time by, um, just picking up new movement, adapting to it. Uh, no matter how long you train, it always seems, you know, I think I learned from and Jen, I think I learned my first sword form after six months and by that time you're pretty well conditioned. You're getting into the system, you know, you're kind of over that, that muscle soreness. That's a constant in the first month or two. And then you learn a new form and it all starts over. And so every time we would learn a new form, it's just like, you're, you're learning that your body has other muscles. And there was always this challenge of, of kind of getting over each one. Right. Uh, so that, that was, that was always kind of special with straight sword. I remember that was one that we got pushed a lot on by master Yen and, coming out and doing drill after drill summer nights, uh, in the dark, in a, in a formation, uh, trying to stay far enough from each other to not hit each other, but also stay close enough to where we can stay together and stay in time. Cause as a class, we have a lot of other requirements that not are, that are not just on your individual ability for the form, but also on staying with each other, staying in line, um, you know, picking up on each other's 
strengths and weaknesses, learning from them, challenging and pushing. Um, there's, there's a lot to be said just about that. Um, and I think that once we got into the weapon forms, those differences in ability become a lot more apparent. You know, in my class, we had people who are pretty well experienced, maybe been training for a long time in other systems or even in Wudang, um, generally have a better ability or talent um, versus people like me who are just completely new to everything uh, and probably just an uncoordinated, you know, clumsy guy at the time. Uh, so that was always like a trial, like, you know, trying to keep up, trying to, you know, put your best every day into each drill, into each practice, right? So that's a whole thing. Uh, I know straight sword was one that we got drilled on a lot because it's got a lot of low stances. It's got a lot of big transitions. And then you're trying to, you know, keep the softness of the form in there as well. So, you know, there, there becomes to be, there comes to be a lot of requirements the more and more you learn, right? Uh, going from straight sword into other weapons into more advanced empty hand forms like your shingi your baji your bagua each one of those um, just came with a, a massive amount of training of basic drilling you know whether it's going through the palms uh, whether it's going through the punching drills whether it's going through the coordination uh, the short dynamic bursts of baji everything has its own system around it and, and for us, we have kind of a, a pretty comprehensive set of different forms and styles and, and, and pieces to the system. But some of those are entire practices on their own, right? Some of it's kind of been incorporated. It's been, it's been wudangified. Um, so things have been brought into the, the Samfam Pai, into our lineage. And I, I do think that there's things that have adapted. There's things that have kind of taken on the, the system that we practice and they become part of our practice now. But some of them have entire histories, entire lineages built around a single practice, right? And so that's something that is different with our lineage. We have a pretty wide variety of, of training, um, but it's also one of those things that once you get to a certain point in the general practice, you could pick one thing and that could become your specialty. That could become your go-to practice, right? So mine didn't come until we started doing double hand weapons. And that's definitely my preference. Uh, learning the eight immortal staff. Um, that of course was my, if you listen to the podcast before, that was kind of my hook, the thing that brought me to the specific school in Wudang. Um, and with that, with the eight immortal system, there's a sword form and there's a staff form. And with both of these, there's so much more happening in terms of body movement um because you're you're replicating and mimicking movements of the eight immortals so there's there's drunken type styles there's movements that replicate uh, like a crippled uh, whether it's a posture or walking posture there's there's very big large kind of flowery movements there's delicate movements there's dynamic there's soft there's lots of balancing movements there's lots of kind of very loose uh, like i said drunken techniques uh, so there's a mix of coordination and you're bouncing from one character to another. And so when you get to the eight immortals, it's very, very challenging, but it's, it's, it's a story in some ways, right? There's, there's so much more happening, uh, in that form where there's a lot to play with. And for me, that was one of the first forms that I actually felt like, you know, you're playing it, that you're, you're putting something in the form for all the basic forms in the first year, two years, you're really just trying to reach a certain level. You're trying to do it a certain way, you know, that your teacher is telling you to do it. You know, this needs to be clear. This needs to be straight. You need to face this way. You need to look this way. You need to keep your back up. You know, all these different things that you're trying to condition, right? And do to a certain standard. Then once you get to these weapons, like the eight immortals weapons or, um, uh, even things like uh, Bagua, uh, some of these systems where there's more of a freedom, not necessarily a freedom of expression, but there is definitely like, there is a more dynamic difference between each practitioner, you know, whether it's the way they move, the speed they, they practice at, 
uh, the body constitution and style they have, that's going to reflect in the form. And so at about the third year in, you know, you're definitely starting to pick up on what each person's individual specialty is, right? What their interest is, what is kind of uh, easy for them to practice, but also suits them, right? And so you'll see people kind of get paired off, you know, the tall guys will start getting staff and spear. Uh, uh, the big muscly broad shoulders will start getting the shovel or the the halberd, you know, the the, the big broadsword. You know, then you'll have the dynamic quick movers start doing things like bagua. You know, uh, it could be shingi tran. Uh, you've got you've got all these different things that start to come out where people start to have their tendencies. You know, it, it starts to become apparent to be oh, not only are you interested in this, but this is the thing that you, that suits you. The way you move, the co the coordination you are natural, naturally gifted at, suits this particular style. And so we start to have typically a, a special empty hand and a special weapon form, right? And that becomes your, 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 your main practice in a way, like especially for individual practice. You're still doing lots of group training. There's still a lot of kind of, you know, drilling and pushing, and there's still more forms to learn, right? But it, I think around the, third, around the third year, you're definitely kind of set in, like you can tell uh, what things you're good at at that point, right? Uh, not just interested in. There's probably a big overlay there. There's a lot of things that, of course, like I'm interested in staff. And so when I got the chance to learn that, of course, I'm going to naturally motivate myself and push myself to be better at it. Um, but I think that there is a pretty general occurrence of your interest in the things that you're good at. And so, you know, those things seem to come a little bit more naturally. So we have a pretty comprehensive system at that time you know we're going through the advanced empty hand sets we're going into all the different weapons we're revisiting them we're going back over fine details uh, these last two years the fourth and fifth year are really about you know fine tuning we're learning more of the internal set you know we're doing some of those more playful forms like tai he, um, doing doing some of the longer forms as well and also trying to connect that training together and seeing how like this coordination uh, from dragon fist is improving our body techniques in 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 shuenwu and and seeing this interplay between how this movement is really the same coordination now we're just holding a weapon in our hand you know and the fourth and fifth year were really difficult for a lot of reasons uh, even outside of training but there was definitely this this connection that was starting to happen for me, definitely, and, and for, I think for everybody, I think, of just seeing the connection, the similarities between the different forms and seeing how one thing can improve the other and how now that we've gone through all the staff techniques, of course, when we learn spear, things are going to come a little bit more naturally because we're picking up on those similarities, right? We're, we're sharing some of that basic training back and forth. Um, and then you also see like when you do reach something like, for example, like the shovel, that can be very difficult. That's one of the later forms we learned. You can see like the reason it's difficult is because of this requirement, this demand for, for strength or this dynamic movement. And you can see how things like the halberd, like the big broadsword, uh, can help you with that coordination, right? Because a lot of the movements are very much the same. And so the fourth, fifth year, there's a, there's a little bit more time dedicated to individual practice. We're definitely starting to get a chance to uh, improve upon what may not be our strength. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely at this point aware of my practices that I'm not great at. Um, I know like the horse hair whisk was always a big challenge for me, still is. And so I, I, I make that kind of a point to have that as part of my practice, right? Um, because that's something that is not my natural talent. Um, but because of that, it's it's one of the easiest things for me to improve on, right? Because I don't do it to a really high level. And so every time I practice it, it's something that's, that's, that's actually challenging me, right? With staff, sometimes I know that here we, we have to do evaluation every Wednesday. And now, even now to do it, um, all the coaches and students who are long-term have to 
draw ping pong balls at random and each ball has a name of a form and when you draw one that's the form that you're going to perform next week because after learning the full set we have some you know almost 30 forms of you know uh, external fast forms and it's very easy to kind of just fall into a pattern of practicing the things that you're good at practicing the things that you know not to say easy but the ones that you know you feel more comfortable doing and there comes to be the time where you're just repeating the same practices and maybe there's a certain practice you haven't done for a little while and so now this is like the system we still use to keep everyone on their toes to make sure that you're you're revisiting everything and you're not really you know just getting comfortable and content with one practice that's one thing that happens as a student. You you don't get to be content because you don't control your training as a traditional class student. I find that really invigorating because you're always challenged. You know, you don't get to say no. <laughs> you don't really get to choose. And while that can be difficult, it is a really good opportunity for growth. And so that's something that a traditional class where you kind of give your control over to your teacher, that's something that I think is very valuable. And I think even in a health class setting in a, in a kind of more casual, uh, sense of learning. I think it's still important to have that standard of this is what I'm interested in, but I I trust you as my teacher, as my master, as my coach, whatever, to bring me to that point. And I will follow you what your teaching is. I will, you know, reserve my, um, kind of my, my enthusiasm for rushing forward and learning something new every class. I think that that's really important as a student to, to understand that, you know, you're explaining your kind of direction and your experience level, but you're trusting your teacher to bring you farther. Right. And that doesn't always happen in in a moment. That's very important. Okay. So that is kind of the the full system, a, a big kind of layout of, of, uh, running through all the different practices. Um, But, you know, I hope you see some of the connections there and and kind of the structure. Um, Maybe in the future, there's there's more information we could go into about, you know, each individual practice, uh, something we'll probably talk about more in detail. But that gives you kind of a general idea of, you know, the standard we're looking for, the way we improve. It's not just learn a form, go to the next one. It's learn a form, then revisit it, then compare it, then contrast, then build upon right? So very important in a traditional sense, in a long-term student, in a disciple to have this kind of environment being created where you're building off your fundamentals all the time and revisiting them. Okay. So that brings me to the next thing. What, what do I practice now? (laughs) Um, with all that in mind, there are a lot of things that, um, to practice and it's not possible to do every single one of them every single day. And so I would say that now I'm, I'm definitely kind of in a maintenance uh, point where I'm practicing the things that I feel more comfortable with, but I'm also sprinkling in those, those challenges. Um, but I would say there's also a difference becoming a teacher where time is a factor and it becomes more about kind of listening to your body and applying the best possible practice, at the best time. So I, you know, I hope I'm, I'm doing a good job with that. That's always kind of the struggle of, you know, the time, uh, balancing the, the kind of class requirements and what people are improving on. And that might be a simplified version, but I try to just lead classes in a way that I would train. You know, I try to, uh, I'm not really going to ask students to do something that I'm not going to try to do. Uh, so I try to lead by example to some degree. Uh, without maybe pushing myself too far so that I can still teach, (laughs) you know, it kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same effect if I'm limping through the class as well. Um, but I think that for the most part, um, I have a a good level of experience to where I can, I can lead the class. I can practice alongside people to motivate them and I can still kind of improve my own practice at the same time. So there, there's some, there's some balance in there to where, um, there's more maintenance is my practice now. Um, but at the same time, I, I do get the chance to review things at random as I'm teaching them. So there's kind of a, a good dynamic there that I enjoy. And I like to teach things in a way that 
I'm able to revisit all those basics and let's let's take this one movement, let's pull it out and let's drill this one thing. And I know it's difficult and I know it's going to be hard. So I'm going to do it next to you and I'm going to torture myself just as hard. And for me, that's that's rewarding in the sense that I get to practice the thing that I like anyway. But also it motivates the student and motivates the class uh, and you create that 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 environment. And so, again, wherever you are having that having that kind of inspiration, that energy is very important. And that's a habit I picked up from the traditional class from my time training, uh, just knowing that if I'm not getting the energy from the teacher, if I'm not getting the energy from my classmates, even though it's kind of a, a justification, an excuse to not train hard, it definitely is an influence, right? It's, it's, it's that self-consciousness. It's that, it's that barrier just to, you know, jump into the discipline, jump into the practice. I know that can be difficult from my own experience. And so I try to jump in the deep end first <laughs> to show people that it's safe, to show people that the water is nice and, you know, we'll, we can torture ourselves. And at the end of class, we'll be happier because of it. Uh, and I find that the most lively after class sessions always come from the most rigorous training. You know, there there is kind of a, in a school, in a training sequence where you have a group of people of course, there's going to be a bonding experience when you all suffer together. Uh, I still think that this is important. So uh, it's all about suffering. Suffering equals growth as long as you don't overdo it. So, um, yeah, and then, and then to this day, I, like I say, I still recommend uh, that same model. So if you're considering learning, if you are learning and you're, you're still kind of building your own structure, or you're, you're, you're trying to, you know, I would say improve upon what you have, whether that's a completely beginning from new, uh, from a flesh, from a fresh slate, or if that is, you know, adapting your training regiment to, to bring new challenges to your practice. I would, I would say that's a good model to follow. You know, look at the traditional model of basic training, make sure you have something. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a thousand of something every day, but make sure you have some kind of fundamental exercise as your your warm up, as your kind of conditioning. So that way you're not just kind of always doing a form, you're not always doing kind of an isolated sequence, uh, a pattern, so to say, for whatever training you're doing. Make sure you have variety, but that variety is still touching on your fundamentals. You know, that that's really important. Um, you're going to get a pretty comprehensive workout training session, uh, drill whatever practice you're doing, that's really important. So revisit the basics if you can build upon them as much as possible, um, because that's how you improve your, your practice, you know, uh, with anything. So basics, basics, basics. Um, if you can start with something more dynamic and then move into something soft. And I mean that in every sense, I mean that in your, your individual class, I mean that in your, your monthly plan. I mean that in your yearly, you know, law, lifelong, uh, training, start with the outside, work your way in, you will build the right pathways and open the roads for the external so that when you get to the internal, you actually be able to move the right way. Okay. Very, very important outside in. So <laughs> now we've got it covered. Like what, what has happened in the last um, 12 years for me. Um, what has changed? You know, what, what could you expect uh, to change in that uh, amount of time? And I'm not going to say that I am the model that you should reference, um, but this is my tea talk. So uh, no, uh, I do think that there's been a lot of changes in the last, in the last 12 years. Uh, of course, there's the, the flexibility, the coordination, these kind of like general things because that's the training right that is the the goal the, the, the accomplishment is apparent because it is the training right um, that becomes your kind of standard right is that basics those those forms and so of course you have this but I think that the training goes so much deeper than that um, for me as an individual while I have some of that conditioning some of that flexibility that coordination those abilities I think that that training, that, that challenge, 
has kind of seeped its way farther into my life, you know, into my daily uh, relationships with people, into my physical well-being, but also into my emotional well-being, my mental well-being. Um, that that's unavoidable, you know, because the amount of time, the amount of intensity of my training period, and also even my teaching period being being pretty much the same standard, but just a different perspective. Um, there is this constant sense of, of awareness of, you know, my attention has to be focused on whether it's the practice or the teaching at the time, I have to be engaged on a, on a, on a more constant basis. That can kind of be overexerting at moments. And it's definitely been difficult, especially during the training, uh, five years, but it is something that brings a very good sense of understanding, uh, and, and honesty because you, you can't really face all of those challenges, uh, without being vulnerable and, and honest with yourself and like really taking a good look at things. You know, because if you're hitting the wall on a new piece of coordination or on something emotionally or whatever it may be, if you're if you're constantly doing the same thing and you're not seeing change, if you're not seeing improvement, um, I think with that amount of time and energy spent on it, the purpose or sorry, the reason is going to be really clear why, you know, and there is a sense of you know, taking a good look at your practice, taking a good look at your relationships or your, your experiences or, or whatever this issue may be, there needs to be like a, a a moment of clarity, you know, and honesty so that you can actually approach that problem clearly, you know, you can actually approach it realistically and deal with it. And physically that's easy, you know, because the time put into it, the energy put into it, when you know that you have a deficiency or a weakness or something like that, you, you can't really ignore it, you know, because it's going to continue to be a problem and potentially it's going to influence the rest of your training, right? Uh, and I think that goes tenfold for anything emotional or mental uh, that you're dealing with. There are no breaks during the program. Uh, I mean, I guess we get one day off a week, but you're really just preparing for the next one. So it's not really a moment of rest. And because of that, you're just, you're always on, you know, you're just always on. You don't have a moment to be off, to be detached, because that could be the moment where, uh, for example, we always would joke about it, but that is the moment that Master Yuan shows up and says, put your gloves on and fight that guy. Uh, that could be the moment that your coach says, we're going to do frog jumps for an hour or run up the mountain barefoot. Or that could be the day that, you know, you have to go do a performance, uh, or you have to do a competition of some kind, or you have to be tested on the thing that you've been trained in some way. You're going to be put on the spot and everything you're working on, whether or not it's complete is going to be tested. And your ability is constantly examined. So there is kind of this intensity on your, on your practice that while it's difficult, it really allows you to take a good look at it and, and you'll notice the pattern. And if you don't, you're probably just tricky to yourself. So very big thing. Um, even though it's always a working progress, that application of those concepts, you know, for, we learned from something like Taiji, um, that application of that is almost just as valuable as the physical practice too, you know? So I think that that's when you, 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 you have to incorporate it. You know, even sometimes we would do things like memorizing the Tao Te Ching or, or, you know, the chanting or doing things like this, where it's just, you're learning by rote, you know, you're just repeat, 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 repeat. And the purpose is at some point, 
they want you to not not to memorize it. They're doing that so that you have so many chances to actually see the purpose, to see the connection, to to be woken up, you know. And so there is definitely that kind of dynamic of, you know, repeat it till you get it, you know, fake it till you make it, do this kind of thing where if it just gets drilled into your head, eventually you'll go, oh yeah, that's why. And that's a big part of traditional training, I think, is, you know, they're not going to give you the answer. They're just going to force the question down your throat until you figure it out. Um, so honesty, definitely key. Um, and I think that that's something for me that uh, has been really difficult, but it's it's definitely something that uh, I can see the value in it immediately. You know, it's, it is those epiphany moments. For me, the change uh, is really uncovering all those layers and, and, and dealing with those new issues, those new problems. And I'm a problem solver. I like to be analytical. And so that's really almost rewarding to have a new question, to have a new uh, thought to chase. So I think that was a, not necessarily a change for me, but definitely a, 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 a new series of opportunity. For me, one of the biggest changes being here was having that challenge to be able to be engaged all the time. Um, growing up, I wasn't really engaged in a traditional school. I wasn't really excited about it or challenged by it. Um, and with martial arts, with the training here, this kind of apprenticeship, master, disciple relationship, it's very hands-on, of course. Um, it's very, very comprehensive. And there's, like I said, there's so many layers to it that you always find something to work on you know no 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 two practice sessions are the same you know there's always something to improve there's always something to remind yourself and there's a new way to apply it there's a new way to to you know understand it a new deeper layer where you're not really doing something different but you're adding more depth to it and for me that keeps me really really engaged you know not having a finish date just having a I don't need to be complete. It's not something you win and you're done. It's something that you revisit and you you constantly improve, right? And you constantly are challenged. And for me, that's that's invigorating because it's it's not a system with an answer. It's a system with a purpose. And so for me, that was definitely the biggest change is just kind of having that that challenge that actually creates more comfortability because you know, like I say, you're engaged, you're active. It's not a passive system. You know, there's a certain sense that you can work on just the understanding of a practice, but understanding and ability are two very different things. Anyone who's practiced martial arts knows that when the teacher says, do it like this, and you say, yeah, I know. And you realize that the next five years of your training, the next 10 years, the next 20 years of your life is just listening to people say the same things over and over and over again. And even though you've been listening to someone telling you it for five years, you're still going, Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. And so, you know, there is that constant uh, aspect to it that I think is really great. Um, super difficult, but very great as an opportunity. And then for me, that, that, that passion for learning has spread into my teaching, right? And so as a teacher, the thing that I love about it and that I never really knew about myself until I became a coach of some sense is that I am really passionate about sharing those moments with others, you know, about, you know, bringing someone to that discovery and then watching them like open that gift, you know, watching them apply that, watching them kind of connect and and click and for me that 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 sharing that that experience is not i'm not going to say it's the same as me doing it because i think that everyone learns their own thing they they experience their own perspective they you know they live their own life and you're going to grow in your own unique individual way and with that there is this kind of kind of not pride, but there is this kind of like sense of accomplishment of like, you know, understanding. There's a sense of understanding between a teacher and a student 
when those moments happen, when that connection is made, this is kind of the the purpose of the practice, right? Is that opportunity for growth has now been shared, has now been transmitted. And now you have this new thing to work on. You have this new understanding, this new outlet, this new sense that you didn't know existed, right? And I think that that is, is the value of it. It's like, it's teaching someone to see, it's teaching someone to feel, it's teaching someone to, to spread that awareness into a deeper part of themselves, you know? And that can't be replicated. It can't be achieved except through that perseverance. And so, you know, being able to assist someone and motivate someone to that point is very valuable to me because I know how much it's meant to me. And I can only imagine what it means to the next person. And so for me, that that depth to practice is the purpose, right? The practice is the purpose. The journey is the destination, right? And of course, in case you can't tell, I can get lost in conversation about that kind of stuff. You know, the, the intricacies of training. Uh, I joke with my students here, you know, teaching something like Tai Chi, if I really, really wanted to get everything out about a single thing, about a one movement even, you know, we would spend too much time on that one aspect of training because there's so many layers to it that I'm not going to say are necessary to know, but that I've experienced and I think that are beneficial. And I think that there's so many ways that you can uncover something and, and explain something. And sometimes it takes going through those different processes to have someone else connect. And so you could be visual, you could be learning by, you know, feeling it, you could understand the technique. Um, you could all of them, you know, you could understand better by having that depth and that clarity. Um, and some of that comes in time, of course, and, and, and kind of drilling and repetition, but, uh, but there is kind of that like puzzle of figuring out, you know, what does, connect with me you know what actually sticks you know what actually makes me remember what actually you know allows me to improve and and how does that affect all the rest of my training you know am i remembering this one technique just because of this technique that was explained or the way it was visualized or the the way i kind of break it down in my head uh, or am i am i applying it to the other movements that i'm doing as well and you know going through that process can be really fun and yeah, like I said, I can get way lost in conversation. If you're listening to these podcasts, you can tell <laughs> that hopefully that, you know, that is definitely my, um, my focus where my attention is uh, quite a bit. So, and I hope that it comes through in, in these mediums. So, uh, a quick, quick thing, uh, definitely if you're interested in those kind of details, I do have to reference, um, the ways of Wudang on general. Um, one of the great things about being a, a student to a disciple, to a teacher, a personal trainer, now a coach, and now teaching online through this medium, uh, has been really, really beneficial because, you know, anyone, everyone always says, if you really want to understand something, teach it. And I do think that there's value to that phrase. I think it's oversimplified sometimes. There's so much you can learn as a student as well. But having the opportunity for myself to be a teacher and to take on this kind of challenge of teaching online through a medium like this, through video and audio, it's been such an eye-opening experience and a rewarding experience. It's allowed me to do all these projects online. It's allowed me to connect to people and hopefully benefit their practice, maybe their lives, in some small, meaningful way, I hope. Um, so I do want to uh, plug for a moment the Ways of Wudang on Patreon. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, there should be a link in the description. Check that out. That is the way that I'm able to continually make these, these videos, these podcasts, um, I'm also teaching online privately and in groups. 
there are tiers there to where you can get access to more resources you know whether it's for music training philosophy book club uh, study resources things like this there's lots of things available there and I, i'm trying to make it a comprehensive set so that you're supporting this exchange you're, you're supporting the free content on youtube um, but you're also getting access to more aspects of the ways more aspects of wudang hopefully connecting you to the mountain um, so that you can improve yourself in your own practice and also as my way of saying thanks for supporting me um, for allowing me to continue this journey um, online um, the ways of wudang on patreon uh, check that out uh, hope to see you there but any way around it i hope that you're you know taking these words to heart and you know applying them to your practice that's really what this is all about patreon allows me to support myself so i can continue to offer this conversation so thank you and back to the podcast um let's see here so uh yeah finishing off i think we should move into some of the the bigger lessons that i've learned because i don't know if i've really changed it's always one of those things that you know you you're always yourself and you feel more like yourself as the years go on and, and maybe that becomes you know crystallized in a certain view of your perspective and your adult life takes on a certain kind of world view and I think, I like to think that I've became more of myself, you know. I know that there's definitely things about me that have changed, but I, 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 I like to think that it's not that I've changed, it's just become, it's just because that I've become more aware of things and I've chosen things to improve upon and I, I it's a work in progress, but I, I hope I'm moving in the right direction. Um, and so have I changed? Yes. But I feel like it's all been for a positive purpose, right? Some kind of growth. Um, I do talk about how, you know, coming to Wudang initially was definitely something I did for myself. But I think that's come full circle. And I, I hope now my experience is something that can be shared by others. And, you know, I, I, I think that I hope... I hope my story is becoming more of a collective journey. You know, it's becoming less about me, you know, what what I've done or am hoping to do, but more about how these practices about this experience can pool into other people, can 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 be applied to other people's journeys and, you know, can outlive my name uh or my purpose but but definitely live on in other people's experience you know and i hope that what i'm offering the teachings the perspective uh, is opening up other doors you know so i think that have i changed yes but i hope i've changed others i think that's my goal at this point for lessons learned, I know that there there are a lot. I want to share with you a few. Um, the first off is nothing ever happens in a moment. Um, this is something I have to remind myself, my students, myself <laughs> all the time. Uh, you know, coming here the first day, of course, you want everything to be. You want to be good. You want to have this ability. You want to have this talent. You want to learn everything. You want, you know, the teacher to be this idol that you can look up to. And, and nothing ever happens in a moment. You know, it's not something we know medicine is good. We know we've got to take medicine for weeks, months. It's not we take all the medicine at one time and we're good tomorrow. You know, that's not how these things work. You know, it's something that has to be applied at the right time over time. And the change is slow. The change is manifested in every step. It's not something you can jump and shortcut. Um, so I think, you know, just keep reminding yourself that it doesn't happen in a moment. It's good that you feel 
stuck. It's good that you 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 feel challenged and you face barriers because that means you're moving forward. You know, that means you're getting somewhere. You know, nothing nothing worth getting has ever been easy, you know. There should be time, there should be challenge. There should be the suffering, you know, to a certain degree. Because those are the things that when you look back, that challenge, that, that barrier, that, that, that adjustment, that's going to become your accomplishment. That's going to become the thing you look back on. You say, that's what I overcame. And so number one on that list is time, you know, and it, it doesn't happen instantaneously. You know, this, this is very, very important. I I always like to think that, you know, uh, everything is a series of half steps, especially in martial arts. And in the beginning, you start learning, you take a big half step all the way to your destination, half step. And you feel that improvement, you feel that change, you feel that, that intensity instantly change and adapt, right? But then every other day after that is another half step, another half step. Until the half steps become so tiny that you barely notice the improvement, <laughs> you know, and you still seem the same distance away from your goal or your, your, your kind of purpose, your destination of some sense. And you still take a half step and a half step and you can never quite get there completely. But that is the purpose of training, right? We're not meant to get there. If we could get there, there'd be a process, there'd be a, a, a step one, two, three, and you'd finish. But we don't finish, we practice, we cultivate. It's something we continually hone and polish and work on. And we're going to get really close and you're going to get a really good perspective and a close view, you know, a very, very, very macro uh, perspective of eventually where you can understand those pieces, those connections, those patterns. But we're not going to fully get there. It's not something we win. It's not something we complete. It's in the not yet completed that we really understand. So apply that to your training. And I think you'll see a lot of improvement because we need to always kind of move forward and grow. And that's not a process that ends. Uh, it's a, it's a journey, right? So keep that in mind as well. Because my next piece of advice is you will always find the easy way out, <laughs> whether that's mentally, emotionally, physically, you are very, very smart. And you will find the justification, you will find the excuse, you will find the ad adjustment of some kind that allows you to take it easy to, to take a step back to rest. And this is good. Sometimes this is a good thing. You know, your body is telling you where and when you can relax and let go. But be aware of that, you know, understand that you're always going to naturally just deviate from training and find the way of least resistance, you know, find the easy way out. And that can be good because you're going to, you know, pay attention and listen to yourself. But it can also be a way to sidestep those challenges and not really go through them, um, not really overcome them, but just kind of move away from them. And that can become something, like I said before, that you can become content with. And that's okay if that's your kind of destination, that's where you're looking to be. But if you're really kind of moving forward and you're looking towards this, this, this accomplishment, this, this goal that you set for yourself, you know, don't look for the easy way out. Uh, I like to say that a lot of improvement, a lot of growth happens right between a rock and a hard place. You know, that's where we find improvement. That's where we find growth. We chase that limitation upward, you know, and we push it higher and higher. You know, that, that temptation never really goes away. That's really important. That temptation is always there. That's what temptation is. It's it's pure essence of distraction of some sort. And you're not going to be able to just put it in a box and separate it from your training or from your emotional well-being, well-being of any kind. But you can understand that that's its purpose. Its purpose is to be there. You can choose to act on it, but it's not going to go away, 
right? You can't stop thinking, you know, you can't stop being disturbed by something. You can cultivate your reaction to that, of course, and you can ease that transition and you can improve upon that when those kind of conditions arrive. But remember <laughs> that it doesn't go away. You know, that, that is something that, you know, has been a challenge for me and, and it's very important, I think. A more direct piece of advice is for any kind of improvement, think about the three stages. Uh, a lot of times we like to say that accuracy, speed, and power. You know, so first you've got to be clear, you've got to have good movement, then you've got to add speed, you've got to get more smooth, and then finally you can add power. You can be dynamic and expressive with your movement. And I think that applies to everything. I like to actually apply it a little bit differently. And I like to say, be stable, be mobile, and then be intense. You know, stability, mobility, intensity. Any practice, any routine, break it down like this. The first thing you should do is you need to be stable. You need to be clear. You need to understand your movement. You need to be able to hold that stance. You need to be able to uh, not change based on the wind <laughs> at the time. Then you can move. Then you can start to apply that principle while you're going through life. Or then you can apply that movement uh, during coordination, right? You do stabilizing muscle drills before you start to do dynamic muscle drills. You know, you start to be mobile once you're stable. So strength before flexibility. Again, external before internal. And then finally, we can add intensity. Now we can start adding that power. We can start adding that, that drive. We can start bringing out the energy of each thing, whether it's a physical practice or not. Now we can actually apply it correctly because we have the accuracy and we have the smoothness, the range of motion and the stability. Now we can add intensity. Very important. And, and finally, um, uncover as many layers as you can. You know, I think that each thing is, again, it's not something you finish. It's another half step. And because of that, we, you know, we have the chance to keep seeing and learning more. Tying this back together, my final note is I once had uh, my, my, my mom say something to me that is really silly, but it's one of those things that stuck with me for a really long time. And it's still something that I, I think about if not daily, you know, weekly, all the time. And one time non nonchalantly, my mom asked me because I was home and we would buy these big jars of peanut butter and I would just go through jars of peanut butter, like nothing. And because it was a, it became a big kind of obsession here while we're training and back home, you just get, get them at any time, uh, much easier to find. And I would just put them in, 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 in drinks, in, in any breakfast, just everything. And we just go through peanut butter. And my mom one time asked me if I was more excited to, of the feeling of finishing a jar and cleaning it out and having it empty, or if it was more of that enjoyment of opening a new one, you know, having that first scoop of peanut butter. If anyone needs peanut butter, you know what I'm talking about. And she asked me this, and it, it's, it's a silly question. And, it, you know, it doesn't really apply to what we've been talking about at first glance. But it was one of those things that I, I still think about. And I still kind of go back and forth, right? Because I think that on one sense, when you have something new, and you have this ability to start something, and it's very engaging, and it's naturally kind of um, rewarding. But it can become something that you're just doing because of the shininess, because of the, the newness of it, the freshness. You know, it's, it's a short-term accomplishment. It's, it's something that you can cross off, right? Um, when you finish the jar, it's just, it's just a task, right? 
but is it something that is creating, right? Are you doing something because you're excited with the potential, you know, the creation, the first scoop? Is it something new to you? Or is it just that job of, of finishing it and now you feel like you've achieved something like, you know, now you've, you've, you can cross something off your to-do list. You know, I, I still go back and forth and I still kind of process this question quite a lot, as silly as it is, because I do think that there's a part of me that I make a daily to-do list and sometimes it, it's just the process of crossing things off you know, of just getting things done and doing that and doing one and two and three and, and seeing like, okay, I did it. I, I did my thing. It's accomplishment. You get your reward feedback loop, uh, you know, your, your endorphins, serotonin, you get, you get this happy feeling when you cross something off, but it becomes kind of a, a small loop of just, oh, I did that thing, you know, just, just opening a new jar just over and over and over again. But is it, is it a challenge, right? Or is it just an obsession? Is it just, is it just something that is short-lived? And I think that we really have to discover for ourselves how much we can create and not just be satisfied with having something new and, and kind of chasing that feeling um, you know, just crossing something off the to-do list or, or any kind of negative impact of something like that, that, that processing. I think that a lot of times we get carried away with just the motions of something, or we get carried away with just starting something new. And so we have to balance that, right? We have to discover how much there is to learn, how much potential we do have, and not just get stuck in those motions. I think we need to learn to love to learn. We need to learn to love to create. And with that grow. I, I hope that means something to you, you know, and I hope that you can persevere in your own self practice in your own improvement cultivation. A decade or more <laughs> seems like a long time. But it starts with one day, and suddenly, it's only a few days away. So, I hope that each day is a new chance. I hope everyone brings you to a closer sense of your own balance. And of course, I hope that each one of those accomplishments comes another cup of tea. Thank you for tuning into today's episode. Subscribe and join me every Tuesday for new episode releases, also available wherever you get your podcasts. Support the Ways of Wudang through Patreon and get access to resources, classes, and more. Keep the conversation going with hashtag T-Talk unfiltered or connect with me directly by joining the Ways of Wudang on Discord. Links are in the description. I'll talk with you next time for another cup of tea.